Exodus 17. Let's go there really fast. And I believe we're going to start at the 8th verse. Exodus 17, verse number 8. If you have it, say amen. So let's read together. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Mm. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar and call the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Uh, for he said, because the Lord had sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. May the Lord's word be blessed forever. Uh, I've titled this, this time that we have together Jehovah Nisi, which is translated, and in some translations, the Lord is my banner. But if I had to subtitle it, I would say, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. He fights for me. He fights for me. Grab the hand of the person standing next to you as we pray. Just squeeze that hand and say, God is fighting for me. He's fighting for me. I'm not walking alone. He's fighting for me. I'm not in this fight by myself. He's fighting for me. He is my banner. I'm not going into that surgery room alone because he's fighting for me. I'm not going into that courthouse alone because he's fighting for me. In every situation of my life, he is fighting for me. Father, we thank you and we honor you because your presence is in this place. Now we yield and surrender our whole selves to you. Have your way, God. Do what you do best and that is be God. We give you permission to engulf this place with your presence. We are your people and we want to hear from heaven. So God, we thank you for this moment, this Kairos moment, this moment of time. May you be pleased with our sacrifice and may heaven touch earth. In Jesus' great and mighty name, amen. Amen. Clap your hands. If you know God is fighting for you, clap your hands. If you know God is fighting for you, somebody praise him. Mike. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Yes, he's fighting for me. Um, so, you know, what is, what is amazing about this text is that I, I'm learning to read the Bible or try to read the Bible in a manner that puts me in context to how they would have um, been looking at their traverse or their travel while they were walking through it. So what that means is sometimes we read and because we can read the end from the beginning, we kind of know how the story goes. And we add a westernized mentality or a mindset and say, now how could they do that? Now they, you know, and we get a little judgmental when we see, you know, especially with Israel, when we see them tripping over and over again, we feel like, ah, you know, how can they not trust God? How can, if God did all this, whatever, whatever. And so, I, but, but I'm trying to reread the Bible and walk through it as if I were walking in that moment. Does it make sense? 
And so part of what, we, you know, in the few moments that we have, part of that will be how we will traverse through this because I want us to put a mindset in of not that we know what the end is, but let's just walk through it. And understanding that Israel's journey with God was very interesting because Israel had been in captivity for 400 years. When Joseph, who was, we know, was the son of, of Israel, Jacob, when Joseph was put in position in Egypt, and his brothers came and he saved them from famine. The Bible records and, and history tells us it was about 75 of the family members that walked in Egypt. But by the time Moses gets on the scene to go and liberate them, Israel had grown to about 600,000 men, not including the women and children. So some historians tell us it could have been at least a million, almost two million people that had grown out of this family of 75. And so they are coming to understand who God is. And God is introducing himself to this people that he's claiming as his own. And so God is establishing his name. He's establishing his name, not just on earth, but he's establishing his name and his credentials, if you will, to this people. So in, 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 in Hebraic times, names were very significant. The name didn't just represent lineage, but it also represented either a scenario or a situation or a promise of something to come. So names had, were, were indicative of who you were, the situation you could have been born in, or where you were being prophesied to go to, okay? So Abram, his name changed to Abraham because God said, you're going to be the father of many nations. So I have to change your name to match your destiny. Adam's name means he of the red earth because God made him out of the earth. So all of these names have significance. Moses' name means pulled out because why? When, when, when they found Moses, he was going down the Nile River and they pulled him out. And so they named him according to the situation in which they found him. Now, we have something similar to that even in our culture. We don't typically focus a lot on the first names. You know, I came through a culture where we focus on last name. Where they say, what's your last name? Oh, you one of them William boys. You one of them Johnsons. Oh, you one of them Bakers. Because that signified the pedigree in which you came from. And so if you had a mama like mine, she said, don't you go messing up my name. And I couldn't understand it. You know, I go to school. I was hyperactive in school. You know, not bad. I was just hyperactive. I had my ways. The school had their agenda. I had mine. And I could not understand. Why y'all laughing at me? I could not understand why my mother was so, was so intentional about telling me that I had to keep our name clean. I was like, this is my name. This ain't your name. And I didn't understand that I was representing a whole line of people with my actions. So names mean something. So much to the point that God is so intentional about names. He says in the Ten Commandments, and we say this all the time, thou shalt not take the Lord God name in vain. Now we think that means cussing. So we try to replace, you know, y'all know them cuss words, y'all... Y'all know, don't look at me like that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But if, if you really have a deeper dive into that, it's not so much just using God's name out of context, but he's saying my name is so strong and powerful that don't just call my name carelessly. Matter of fact, back in Hebraic times and biblical times, they wouldn't even utter his name because the name of God was so sacred. Matter of fact, they didn't even know his name until Moses got on the scene. He says, Moses, I introduced myself to them by this, but they didn't even really know what my real name is because they didn't deserve to know what my, you don't even know how to carry my real name. And so God is so intentional about establishing his name that he gives them scenarios and situations where they have to name it according to what he did. And so we see this. And so in this, the other thing that I find is that understanding that the children of Israel knew who God was based off of the stories that they, were heard, that they heard. 
But God is now introducing them to him through experiences. Let me pause and say that sometimes many of us in this room have come to know God through stories that we heard. Testimonies are important. That's why you should never stop testifying because somebody is learning more about God through your testimony. Somebody is being drawn to the body of Christ every time they hear you magnify him and make him big. Not just in this building, but when you go to the grocery store or to the nail shop or to the barber shop and you start to brag on God, something happens with your testimony that reverberates in the place that you are and somebody is appealed to come to God. Somebody is saying, wait a minute, I am learning more about the nature of God through your story. But that's just one level. Because God doesn't want you just to be a story to him, but he wants to have an experience with you. And so what we see the children of Israel doing is now they're walking through the experience of God. And God is taking them through certain situations. And for them, they don't understand it, but God is showing them who he is. So we know the story. Let's just recount it for those that may not be as familiar. Israel is in Egypt. They're in exile. They're in, in captivity. Moses gets the commandment from God to go down to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. They go through all of these different things to until Pharaoh says, here, take your people. And then they come out rejoicing. And then God has liberated his people. And Israel is thinking, let's walk through it together. Israel is thinking 400 years of slavery and now we're free. God has promised us Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. It's easy street. And then God leads them to a body of water that's standing in their way. Ain't that just like God? You think you didn't got through, you didn't came through, the report was clear, you went to the doctor, doctor said, listen, we couldn't find nothing, you shouting, you said, whew, finally, and then you go to your car, your car don't start, say, God, listen, what's going on? Here, Israel, catch it, they've been in bondage and in slavery for all of these years, they've been toiled and tasked with all of this, and they finally get liberated, and imagine walking out of slavery into freedom and then you get to a place where you can't go no more and then you look back and the people that had you in bondage are coming to get you again to break you back and you're saying wait a minute God did you bring me out of bondage to die out of water did you free me so that you could kill me in the place of freedom and so this is the first example of God showing himself to them to be strong and mighty. And so we know the story. You know, Moses holds up his hand. He parts the Red Sea. They walk across on dry land. God floods the sea when Pharaoh gets in there. And they go and they keep going on. And then God says, take them this route. And he takes them a specific route. And they go through. They go to one place. And they start to complain because they don't have any food. And they say, Moses, did you bring us out here to kill us? And so Moses beseeches God and he says, okay, I'm gonna bring manna, I'm gonna bring quail, great. Then they go to another place and then there's no water. They say, man, we're gonna die of thirst? And they have all of these experiences and they show up. And so it gets to our test, text when we get to 17 that, that in the earlier part of chapter 17, they get to a place where the Bible says the wilderness of sin where they are complaining because they're thirsty and they're saying, Moses, we need water. And so the Bible says Moses talks to God. Moses says, God, listen, they're getting ready to stone me because you didn't have me bring them all the way out here. They first were hungry, you know, then they tired. Now they thirsty. And God says to Moses, I want you to strike a rock. I want you to take your rod and strike a rock, and there I will bring water out. Now, if I had time, I would talk about how that was a type of Christ that was happening. That as he was striking the rock, it was symbolic of how Christ would be smitten for us. That Christ is our living water. And what God was showing Moses for us to see all the way in 2024, that as Moses had to strike the rock to get living water out for the Israelites, so we can go to Christ who is our living water and get water to feed our souls. But that's not where we want to hang our hat right now. So after all of that, after all of these experiences and they come through it, after they're trying to learn who God is, after they're walking in his will, isn't it amazing that you can be walking in the will of God and God's will will lead you to a wilderness? 
Anybody ever experienced walking in God and say, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm doing, and you feel like, God, I'm doing everything you want me to do, but it feels like a wilderness. Why would the God who produces water bring me to a place where there is no water? Why would the God who is the bread of heaven bring me to a place where there is no bread? Why would, if I'm walking in your will, if I'm walking in your way, and I'm doing what you told me to do, I've come out of sin and I've come into freedom. Why in the world would you lead me to a place where now I'm thirsty and I'm hungry and people are chasing me? Why, if I'm doing what you told me to do, why can't I not see the fruit of my labor? Walking in God's will, leading them into a wilderness. And not only are they led into a wilderness, but check this out. When they get to this place called Rephidim, there is a battle that they don't even know they're getting ready to fight. Now, these are not warriors. Israel is not a warring country, a warring people. They're not. They've never been in war. They've been in captivity. And so now they come to this place after being hungry, after being tired, after walking, after fighting uh, 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 this, this sea, walking through this Red Sea, all of these things. They come to a place and now they have to go into battle with, well, check this out, their cousin. So let's talk about Amalek. Amalek is of the line of Esau. Esau was Jacob's twin brother, okay? So if we understand biblical history, we understand that Jacob and Esau, they, the, the Bible already, already tells us that there, were, there was tension between the two because of some tricksting stuff going on, right? And so Jacob and Esau have had this contention with them their whole life. They did make up, but it was in the DNA of them to be warring against each other. So when Amalek comes along, Amalek is of that line. And the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy that Amalek was laying in wait to establish war against Israel. That there are some problems that are laying in wait to topple you that you don't even see coming that there are some things that you feel like you're walking through and God is supplying and you don't even know that there is something laying in wait and it's so close and what Amalek represents is that thing in your bloodline that thing in your family that thing that has been traversing you over and over down through the years it's the thing that comes out of nowhere to topple you and to take you over Amalek represents this cousin this family line anybody ever have trouble in your family Amalek represents this problem that we all have that seems to never go away maybe it's a generational curse as we call it something that's been in your family line something in a disease that's been in your family line high blood pressure all these things that we feel like that we deal with over and over and over again and Amalek the Bible says is waiting waiting to go at war with Israel with a people that don't know how to fight. And, at, and, and this is the dirty thing about Amalek. Because, now I told you, Israel is about a million, two million strong. And so in that time, the way they were established as they were walking, the strong were at the front. The weaker were at the back. So the women and the children were in the back while the strong men were up front. And Amalek attacks the back of the camp where they were most weakest, where they were vulnerable. Anybody ever felt like you've been attacked at your most vulnerable time? Anybody ever feel like the devil attacked you? Not when you were strong and in church and doing all whatever, but when you were weak, when you were grieving, here comes that old devil, that old enemy attacking you at your lowest time. And instead of getting mad at the enemy, they get mad at God. Like some of us. Like we have. Like, God, why would you let this come at a time that, listen, you know I ain't have no money. Why the car got to break down when, on the week that I didn't get paid? <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Problems and trouble. And Amalek represents this idea that trouble, the inconvenience of trouble that comes at your most weakest and vulnerable moment. He attacks from the back to a people that are not prepared for war. 
to a people to a people that are prepared for battle he attacks at the most vulnerable time because remember they had just gotten water they had been thirsty they had been hungry they're just getting their knees met and then all of a sudden there's a battle let me pause right there and see is anybody in a battle is anybody fighting anything can anybody understand the words that are coming to my mouth? Anybody understand that there are times in our life that we're trying to figure out, God, why would you lead me into a wilderness and then lead me to a place with no water and then let me be attacked when I am least prepared? And so they asked the question in a couple of verses before. They say, is God amongst us or not? Now, we can judge that, but the reality of it is, I don't know about you, but I've asked myself that same question. God, where are you? Why are you asleep on a boat when the ship is rocking? Why, with this storm going on, Jesus, why you got your head on a cot when we getting ready to get killed? Anybody ever wonder, where is God in the midst of my trouble, in the midst of my battle? God, this bill is here, and this sickness is here, and the IRS is here, and this person is here, and it's not outside trouble, it's inside trouble, because sometimes the biggest trouble is the people that are closest to me. Why would you let someone one that's supposed to be my blood attack me God in my vulnerable state father this is supposed to be my family I could understand if it was an enemy but this is somebody in my same line in my same lineage why would you let them come after me like this why do I have to deal with Amalek and so God says God says okay we're gonna deal with this and so Moses tells Joshua. Now, this is the first time we're seeing Joshua. We've never, Joshua's name has never shown up in Scripture before. And so we get the foreshadow of who Joshua is going to be to the children of Israel going forward. Moses says to Joshua, go pick out people. Now, isn't that crazy? Now, it's about a million people. It's about a million people. But because they're not warriors, Moses tells Joshua, go pick out people to fight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up on the mountain tomorrow. This is our battle strategy. Okay? So, Moses goes up on the mountain. Joshua picks up people to fight. And we read the story. We understand that what starts to happen is as Moses lifts up his hand, Israel prevails. Moses drops his hand. Amalek prevails. My problem as I looked at this is, what's wrong with the strategy? Why do I say that? Because in the times before, when Moses would lift up his hand, redemption would happen, okay? At the Red Sea, he lifted up his hands, the sea parted, they walked across. Everything was good. They needed water, he went, struck it one time, water came out. So in my mind, Moses is saying, I'm going to employ the same strategy here that I've done before. Maybe that hasn't been your testimony, but it's been mine. I said, okay, well, this worked last time. I'm going to do it again. Okay, that prayer worked last time. Okay, God, please, this speeding ticket, Father, in the name of Jesus. You know I was trying to get to church. God allow anybody I've been driving, you see the plea, you like, Lord, just make my car invisible. Just or Lord, 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 make make that machine malfunction in the name of Jesus. <laughs> And so Moses employs a strategy that he's done before. He goes up, extends his hand, and they start to win. But then the Bible says he drops his hand. Maybe he was thinking, that's all I had to do. We got it. Maybe he was thinking, you know what? That was enough. We're winning. I can rest now. But when he drops his hand, they start to lose. When God... Okay, I'm praying, and I feel like when I start praying, everything goes well, and then I stop praying, and then all hell breaks loose. And then I ask myself this question. So does that mean that I can never cease of doing this in order to get the victory? What is my recourse? Because I can imagine Moses was confused. I would have been confused. God, this worked before. 
This is the same thing you told me to do before. This is the same strategy you gave me before. God, why is your plan not working now? God, what is wrong with what I am doing? I'm doing what you told me to do. You told me to stretch out my hand, put up the rod, and that we would get the win. We would win the war. We would have the battle. And I did that, and we were winning. But Father, when I put it down, now we're losing. I don't understand. And then the Bible says Moses gets tired Moses the intercessor gets tired that's a dangerous thing when the intercessor gets tired that that not only has he had to deal with argumentative people leadership is hard y'all let me tell you something. Leading people is, is that leading people is hard. Leading people is challenging because we see we see Israel's plight, but we never look at Moses' plight because Moses is learning God at the same time. Moses did not grow up understanding who God is. So he went from seeing God show up in a bush to asking God. He didn't even know God's name. He says, God, when I go down there, they're not going to even believe that you sent me. Who should I tell them sent me? And all God says is, tell them I am. One translation, what I love, says, God says, tell him, I will be what I will be. Whoo! When I read that, that made me shout because I can understand. I, I'm glad I have a God that will be whatever it is that I need him to be. And the thing is, what Moses was not understanding, maybe, and what, the Israel's not, what Israel did not know is that God declaring that I will be what I will be, that I am that I am, means that every scenario or situation that you show up in, I, I change to be that whatever you need me to be. And that is a word for somebody in this sanctuary and online right now that whatever you are facing in your life uh, the I am that I am uh, is showing up uh, and he says you don't even have to ask me for it uh, because I will be uh, what I need to be uh, in the situation that you're in uh, if you need water I'll turn into a rock uh, and I'll become water if you need bread uh, I'll be little flakes that come from the sky uh, and I'll be called manna if you need me uh, I'll show up uh, and I will be what you need me to be So in this situation, they're facing a battle, and God is saying, I will be it. And so how does he show up? So I love this. So we understand that Aaron and her, Aaron is the brother of Moses, and some accounts tell us her is the brother-in-law. We don't know, but it could be of Moses. And the Bible says that they go up with Moses to the top of the hill. Now, this is what I love. Now, they're up there. Moses is the intercessor. He's doing what he's doing. He's praying, which is the extending of the hands. He's doing that Joshua's down fighting because while Moses is praying, someone is down doing the work. When Moses gets tired, the Bible says Aaron and her put a rock for Moses to sit on and get on either side of him and hold his hands up. So now... The easy revelation of that is, make sure you got some people who will hold you up. Yeah. Amen. All of that. Beautiful. But, but the deeper point for me is that Moses did not give Aaron and her instructions on what to do. What I love about the indication in the scripture is that Aaron and her were so in tune to what the leader needed that before he could ask for it, they had a strategy of their own. And I came to tell you that you better get somebody and get linked up with somebody who understands what you need, uh, who's not jealous of you, who's not vindictive of you, uh, who's not waiting for you to fail, who's not saying, hey, give me a chance. Uh, because one of them could have said, Moses, uh, give me the rod. Uh, I'll stand in your place. Uh, but what they said is, let's get on either side of the leader and hold him up uh, because we need to strengthen him. And they did it without the prompting or the initiation of Moses. They did it because they were instinctively connected to who they were supporting. 
I wonder if you have people in your life who are so connected to you that they can tell when you're getting tired and without you having to ask and without you out having to prompt, uh, they get on either side of you and they strategize and they say, how can we support this ministry? How can we support her business? Uh, how can we support that health? Uh, how can we support those children? Uh, you don't have to ask me. Uh, you don't have to give me a prize. Uh, you don't have to give me an applaud. Uh, I'm just going to be on either side of you uh, and I'm going to do what I have to do uh, to keep you steady. Because the reality of it is holding Moses' arms up made their arms tired too. Being a support to someone doesn't mean you have all the strength, but it means you sacrifice because you understand uh, that the person that I'm connected to, uh, if they fall, I fall. So I'm going to keep them lifted. And the other thing, if I flip to the end, uh, there is never any mention of what Aaron and her did as a support to Moses. There's no applause that they get. Nobody says, oh, thank y'all. If y'all hadn't been there. But the reality of it is the battle was won because Moses had trusted people beside him that, that knew what needed to happen and did what needed to be done. And I started to review and I said, God, this is, this is something. This is something T to now have the picture. Check this picture out. Moses standing, sitting on the rock, one arm here, one arm here, and they win. And I started to say, what, is this, what does this look like? What does it look like to have, now, now let me pause. There's a word that we, there's a Hebrew word for what happened. It's called yada. So yada is an expression that, that in, in Hebraic terms means prayer and praise. And yada is an extension of the hands. So, do you know, when we do this in worship, sometimes when we say lift up your hands, we think we're just lifting up, but what you're actually doing is what Moses did. You're yada, and you extend your hands, because what it says is, uh, I am pointing up to where power comes from. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. So the next time you lift up your hands, uh, you ought to remind yourself uh, that I'm not just lifting my hands, I'm not just pointing, uh, but I am pointing to where my help is. Uh, I am reminding my situation, uh, I'm reminding my battle, I'm reminding my circumstance uh, that as I yada as I lift up uh, that there is a power higher than I am uh, that there is something higher than I uh, and I'm pointing you to uh, where my power comes from but even more than that look at the image that they created that one had the arm stretched out this way one had the arm stretched out this way and they were on top of a hill Thank you, Holy Ghost. And on top of the hill, as the people were fighting beneath, when they looked up, they saw this. And as long as Moses had his arms stretched, they won. Then it made sense why the arms couldn't drop. Because as long as the cross, as long as the representation of the work is visible, I can win the battle. But this is the good news that even in 2024, because Christ did the completed, finished work, the cross is still standing. And everything that I experience, every battle that I go through, every circumstance that comes my way, what it sees is the... It sees the image of the cross as my banner. So Moses, Aaron, and her make this image. And it is the reason why the Bible says, uh, even to the dawn, uh, they kept his hand steady and they won. Uh, and I want to tell you tonight uh, that there is a cross uh, that's standing in your life. Uh, that when Christ uh, laid one hand on this side uh, and one hand on that side, uh, and when he went to the cross uh, and said, it is finished uh, and it is done, um, he was doing it for me and you uh, so that the situation that we would come up against in 2024 would see his cross, his nailed hands, and his nailed feet and understand that as I lift up, when I lift up, I'm pointing to the cross. My yada is pointing to that image. 
reminding the enemy reminding my problems uh, that I am not walking alone uh, that he fights for me but the story doesn't end there they win and after they win God says to Moses he says I want you to write this as a memorial and rehearse this in the hearing of Joshua Joshua now why is that important because, again, remember, the stories that they heard about God helped shape who God was to them. And God did not want them to forget that this battle that you saw with Amalek, I'm getting ready to wipe Amalek from the face. You're not going to have to deal with Amalek for the rest of your days. And that's a word for somebody in this house. You ought to write down your victory and rehearse your win. You ought to not let anybody stop you from talking about what God has done for you, but you ought to rehearse it every chance you get because you got to remind yourself, I'm not going to deal with this sickness all my life. I'm not going to deal with this trouble all all my life I'm not gonna deal with this devil all my life but God let me win this battle to remind me uh, that greater is he that's in me uh, than he that is in the world uh, he built this he built this altar Moses built this altar to remind the people of Jehovah Nisi Jehovah Nisi means the Lord is my banner the Bible says that Moses after he writes he builds an altar. An altar represents worship. It represents sacrifice. That after he won the war, they didn't just celebrate, but he worshiped. That after they come off of this victory, he didn't go and clap it up and enjoy the time, but he did the very first thing that we ought to do, that when God gives you the victory, your response should be, let me build him an altar let me worship him so that every time I come back to this place I am reminded of the victory that he gave me the problem sometimes in our life is that we forget what God has done and then we come to another situation and then we ask God the same question and God is saying if you just build an altar if you just rehearse the victory you won't have to question if I'm going to do it again you won't have to question if I'm going to come through again because what I did before I'll do it again I am the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. I am, I am that I am. I will be, I will be your victory every time you show up to the fight. And all I need for you to do is build me an altar. <laughs> Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. What is a banner? So in those times, a banner represented a couple of things. Banners were really established for companies, for, for armies, for soldiers, and it helped people recognize who they were fighting against. So you would see in certain towns these large flagpoles and the banner, and the banners would be waving a certain way to point to what was inside. If it was in front of a temple building, the banner would be pointing to what was inside because it was, it was the contents of inside that the banner would be pointing to. So when Moses says, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner, what he is saying is every time we go into battle, we have someone flying above us. We have a banner. We have something that's representing us in victory. We have something that's telling our enemies uh, that they are not alone, uh, that I am fighting with them, uh, I am fighting for them, uh, that Jehovah is our banner. And I got excited when I read that uh, because I understand uh, that there are some situations and circumstances in my life and I need a reminder to them that Jehovah is my banner. I want them to look my way and say I can't go that way because he's got a banner flying over him. He's protected by the almighty God. He's protected by I am that I am. He's protected by Jehovah so cancer has to back up when it sees the banner. Disease has to back up when it sees the banner. Depression backs up because there's a banner that's waving over me uh, Jehovah is my banner so Moses builds an altar he builds an altar to God and he calls the altar Jehovah Nisi as a reminder to the Israelites that we have protection 
<laughs> Thank you, Lord. But, but not just that. It's, it's one other thing. Gabby, what's that in your hand? What's, what's almost forgot about this wooden stick? This thing from a dead tree. That, that the thing in the story that connects all these miracles was something that God gave to Moses when he called him from the burning bush. He says, he says, what's that in your hand? Now, it's not uncommon for a shepherd to have a walking stick because the stick warded off trouble from the sheep. And so when Moses, the shepherd who had never led anybody, is being called by God, God asked him, what's in your hand? I wonder if God is asking anybody tonight, what's in your hand? What seems so insignificant that you're discarding, but it's the thing that's going to give you the victory? Because rods represent the authority of God, the power of God. And so what came out of what seemed insignificant was the thing that parted the Red Sea, was the thing that brought water from a rock, was the thing that held up when they were fighting the Amal Amalekites and they won the battle. And I'm wanting to know tonight that what is it in your hand that God has given you that you discarded because you thought it was worthless? What has God given you that you've forgotten about? That you keep losing, but if you just picked up what was supposed to be in your hand, you could see miracles too. This, this rod, this thing is representative of the authority that God has given you. What is in your hand tonight? What is God looking at you and saying, I've given you something? that you're gonna come up against a body of water and you're gonna need something to part it. You're gonna come up against an army and you're gonna to need to raise a banner because when they see this, they just don't see a stick, but they see a representative of who Jesus Christ is, power and authority. What is in your hand? What has God given you to fight with? that you have put down because you thought it was insignificant. He's asking you the question, what is in your hand? Last thing, and I'm closing, is that as God is our banner, and while I was preparing this, the Holy Spirit reminded me that not only is God my banner, but I'm also a banner to God. That the reality of it is that as God waves for me, I also am waving for God. That I am a representative of him in the earth. That I am God's banner. And I was challenged because what does my banner represent? When people see your banner, what are they reading? When people see your banner, what does it represent? Is it pointing to the Savior or is your banner pointing to something else? Is your banner a reminder that God is faithful and God is just and God is love and God is good? But is your banner a reminder of all the bad things? What are you waving in the earth that represents God? I came to challenge us tonight, not to shout us, but to make us think that as God is fighting for us, he's expecting us to stand for him. As God is our banner, how am I representing that that is representing me? 
The second challenge is, what am I using that's supposed to be in my hand to bring me the victory? Sometimes you have to review all the tools that God has given you. I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life, I have discarded things that really could have been beneficial because they didn't seem significant. Not even just things, but people. Who are the people that God have put in your path, in your place, that you are discarding because you feel like they are nobody or nothing? And these could be your errands and your hers. These might be the ones to hold your arm up when you get weak. Maybe you're not winning the battle because you're not linked up to the right person that's instinctively got your best interest at heart. Maybe your relationships are off because you've linked up with people who are secretly jealous of you and want your role instead of wanting to support you in your role. It would have been a whole different story if Aaron and her had been jealous of Moses and stand there and let his arms fall because they didn't want him to get the victory on the Israelites' behalf. It would have been a different story if Aaron and her would have been jealous and said, Moses, you're not the only one that can hold the rod. Give me a chance to do it. But Moses had the right people connected to him. Are you connected to the right people that are going to support your business, support your ministry, support you when you get weak? What is in your hand? Do you have the right thing in your hand? I feel God is challenging us tonight to review not just who we are, but who we are connected to.